Welcome back to our sermon series titled Prayer Warriors of Old. Today we're going to look at Elisha, the man who saw the unseen. Let's begin by reading 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. It talks here about an Aramean plot in the Old Testament to capture the prophet Elisha. And it says, beginning in verse 8, Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. The king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. When they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? He answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master, and the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. So we're thinking about the prophet Elisha today, the man who could see the unseen. You know, years back I read J.C. Ryle's very classic book, Holiness. Holiness. I commend that to you if you've never read it. The final chapter of the book is called Christ is All, and it's a wonderful exposition of the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. I realized that this man of God, writing over a century ago, J.C. Ryle, had put his finger on a major problem facing evangelical Christianity in our day. We have failed often to direct God's people to their resources in the all-sufficient Christ. Now, believers with problems are not being told that Jesus Christ is sufficient for every problem in life. Here's how you can lay hold of him through faith and prayer. They're not being told that. Rather, they are being directed into all sorts of, of worldly techniques and even therapies and programs where Christ at best is just peripheral. He's not the central thing or the main thing. Some time ago, I read Dr. John MacArthur's book, Our Sufficiency of Christ, in Christ, and he makes the same point. Let me share a little bit of his thoughts from that book. He writes, A widespread lack of confidence in Christ's sufficiency is threatening the contemporary church. Too many Christians have tacitly acquiesced to the notion that our riches in Christ, including Scripture and prayer and the indwelling Holy Spirit and all the other spiritual resources we find in Christ, 
Well, those simply, we are being taught, are not adequate to meet people's real needs. Dr. MacArthur goes on to say, he says, entire churches are committed to programs built on the presupposition that the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer aren't a full enough agenda for the church as it prepares to live within the 21st century. And so we have a challenge. We don't see the sufficiency of Christ. We don't believe in the power of what God has given us in the ordinary means of grace. And with that as a background, I want to continue our study of prayer this morning by looking at an incident in the life of the prophet Elisha. Now, as we heard a moment ago in 2 Kings, the great prophet faced a major crisis. He was surrounded by an, uh, uh, an enemy army, a foreign army, that really was sent there just solely to take him captive. And so Elisha's servant went out one morning and he looked up and he saw this horde of soldiers. And they had horses and they had chariots and all of the accoutrements of an ancient army. And the servant, well, he rightly surmised that they weren't paying a social call to them. And so he ran back inside, crying out to Elisha, Alas, what are we going to do? Now, when I think about our own life, probably none of us has ever walked out the door in the morning to confront a, a barbarian horde that's armed to the teeth. We didn't find them in the front yard waiting to do us bodily harm. But you know, we all know what it's like to be suddenly confronted with life-threatening problems beyond our control. Certainly, we have faced that in this pandemic time. And of course, we can all relate to the servant's panic in the midst of that crisis. We've been experiencing a bit of a national panic during the pandemic. You know, what seems strange as I encounter this story in 2 Kings is Elisha's cool, calm response in verse 16. He says, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes would be opened. And suddenly the servant saw the unseen spiritual world that Elisha had already saw. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And he strolled out to greet the soldiers and he calmly asked God to strike them blind. And then he led them to the capital city, 12 miles south, where they were then surrounded by Israel's army. And then he asked God to restore their sight. And then he actually directed the Israelite king to feed them and send them on their way. And it turns out historically for a while, the Arameans, they did not bother Israel. Now, this text has two main themes that I want to explore. The first is the all-sufficiency of God to meet any crisis that we face. And the second theme is that prayer is our means of access to our all-sufficient God. And so the major theme of the sermon today I would summarize in this way. Since God is our all-sufficient resource, believers should pray and not panic when trials hit. Let's explore this first theme together, the fact that God is our all-sufficient resource in times of trial. We begin with the remembrance from Scripture that the greatness of God's knowledge and His power and His sovereignty are really on display here in our text. It's interesting that of all the major figures of the Bible, no one except Elisha is mentioned by name in this text, not the kings or even Elisha's servant. Even Elisha is called three times the man of God. One commentator says that this may suggest that readers should focus on the Lord and his prophet. And so when we look at God, we learn three things in relation to our trials as we consider this story. The first thing is that our God is omniscient. That is to say, he knows all things and he possesses all wisdom. You know, God knew what the Aramean king, a man by the name of Ben-Hadad II, was planning to do, and he revealed it to Elisha, who in turn told the Israelite king Jehoram what was up. As Ben-Hadad's servants told him, Elisha, even in verse 12, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. 
You know, it took the intelligence experts more than 2,500 years after this to be able to bug a room. But God is much more effective than the CIA. He knows every thought and every motive of every human heart. Nothing is hid from him, as we're told in Hebrews 4.13. Now, the Aramean king very foolishly thought that he could send troops and take Elisha captive. Of course, at this point, I asked myself, didn't he realize that Elisha would know this in advance too? Elisha could have hidden himself, but he knew that God wanted to solve this problem in a way that would teach the Aramean king and the king of Israel some lessons about the reality of the living God. My friends, it's a reminder that our God knows everything. He's omniscient. We are foolish to think that we can hide anything from him. He knows all our secret thoughts. He knows all our words and deeds. His word reveals to us what we need to know about how to deal with life's problems, whether major or minor. We can go to him for the wisdom that we lack is the point. And of course, it is in the context of trials that James 1 verse 5 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all people generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So we learn that our God is omniscient. But secondly, we learn that our God is omnipotent. Omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He not only knows how to solve our problems, he has unlimited power to deal with the biggest problems we can conceive of. I wonder, as you're facing your own problems right now, is your problem as big as a hostile army that's trying to get you? King David put it this way in Psalm 34, 7. He said, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Therefore, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. You know, it was no big deal for God to strike all these men blind in response to Elisha's simple prayer. There is no man or nation so powerful, but that God can easily bring him or it to nothing. That means, of course, that God is able to deal with any problem you have, no matter how big it is to you. I always chuckle when I think of the woman who came to the well-known Bible teacher, G. Campbell Morgan, and she asked him, Dr. Morgan, do you think we should pray about little things or just big problems? Well, he straightened up and in his formal British manner said, Madam, can you think of anything in your life that is too big to God? You know, our God is omniscient and omnipotent. He spoke the universe into existence. Nothing is too difficult for him. Now, you may be thinking right now, well, that's nice, but it doesn't work for me the way it worked for Elisha. If only I could utter a short prayer and all my problems were instantly solved, just like these soldiers were struck blind. Well, beloved, that leads to the third thing we see here concerning our all-sufficient God. Our God sovereignly protects his own according to his will. What I mean by this is that if we belong to God, we can trust him to protect us until the moment he calls us to be with him. As Psalm 91 verse 11 promises, it says, He will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. My friends, the Lord is stronger than the most powerful enemy we can conceive of. He's protecting us even when we aren't aware of it. You know, Elisha's servant slept peacefully all night, not knowing that these hostile forces were surrounding him. And when he saw them in the morning, he panicked. But the fact is, God's protection was there, even though he couldn't see it. Of course, you still may be thinking, well, that's great when it all works out as neatly as it did with Elisha. But what about when God's people go through horrible trials and even death? Some godly people will suffer for years or die through disease or persecution. Where is God's protection then, Matthew? My friends, the Lord provides a clue in a minor detail of the text that we might easily miss, and so I want to point it out to you. Did you notice where Elisha was when this army surrounded him? We're told in verse 13 that he was in Dothan. It seems like more than coincidence that this town is mentioned only one other time in the Bible. It was the town where Joseph found his brothers when his father sent him to find out how they were doing. We read about that back in Genesis 37. Remember, Joseph hadn't been able to locate them, and he was wandering in a field when a man told him that they had gone to Dothan. Now, when Joseph arrived there, his brothers threw him in a pit. 
and were about to kill him when a caravan passed by heading for Egypt. And so instead they sold him into slavery. Now you know the story, how after many years as a slave and prisoner, God finally appointed Joseph over all Egypt under Pharaoh. As he sat in the pit in Dothan, or as he traveled in chains to Egypt, or even as he sat in chains in the Egyptian dungeon, Joseph never had a vision of chariots of fire surrounding him. After all, where were the angels and chariots when Joseph was suffering? We well, you know Joseph, much later in life, looked back on the years of trial and he told his brothers this in Genesis 50 verse 20. He said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You know, Joseph, even though he didn't see any angels or even though he went through many years of agony, he knew that God was sovereignly directing all of his circumstances. Beloved, the point is this. Even though you or I may never get a vision of God's angels surrounding us, they are there. Even if you spend years in a dungeon, our sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent God has not abandoned you. Elisha's servant was safe because he was with his master. Even so, we are safe because we are identified with our master, Jesus Christ, who said that our heavenly father even has the hairs on our head numbered. A little easier for some than others. Therefore, he said, do not fear those who kill the body, but are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. But of course, the question is, how can we not panic when trials hit? And this brings me to the second major theme. Prayer is the way to have peace, not panic when trials hit. You know, the Bible tells us that prayer is our means of access to our all-sufficient Savior. As Paul wrote from prison in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, my friends, I know major trials can hit so suddenly. Elisha's servant went to bed peacefully with no thought of being surrounded by a menacing army the next morning. But he woke up and he saw this army and he no doubt thought, <laughs> I could die today. Life is really that uncertain, isn't it? Let's face it, there are lots of ways that we could be dead before today is over. A terrorist attack, a major earthquake, a fire, an accident in the car on the highway, a, a blood vessel in our brain ruptures. Life is fragile. That's why it's foolish to live for this life only, as if there were no eternity. The uncertainty of life should make us live every day in dependence upon God. Of course, I'm reminded first that prayer replaces panic with wisdom for dealing with trials. You know, as we look at this text together, there is an obvious contrast between the panic of Elisha's servant and the peace of Elisha. The difference, I think, is accounted for by Elisha's consistent communion with God in prayer. Although the text doesn't state it directly, obviously it was through prayer that he had gained supernatural knowledge of the enemy's planned raids. You know, I believe that Elisha knew how God wanted him to deal with this crisis because he had already prayed very much. Elisha's mentor, remember, was the prophet Elijah, who had called down fire from heaven to consume some soldiers who came to take him captive. We read about that in 2 Kings 1. On a previous occasion, Elisha himself had cursed in the name of the Lord a bunch of young men who taunted him, resulting in some bears killing 42 of them. But on this occasion, I think that Elisha knew through prayer that God wanted to deal differently with this foreign army. You know, the Aramean king had already seen evidence of the reality of Israel's God when Elisha had healed Naaman, the captain of his army, in 2 Kings 5. Israel's wicked king Jehoram, son of Ahab, yes, that Ahab and Jezebel, also should have known that Yahweh is the only true God. And through Elisha's gracious treatment of these soldiers, both kings and both armies had further evidence of God's kindness and his power. And though we don't read it directly, I believe that Elisha had gained the wisdom to know how to handle this trial the way he did, through prayer. 
You know, beloved, God may or may not grant us miraculous insight and power as he did here with Elisha. But if we are people of prayer and we commune with God through his word, we will have unusual wisdom for dealing with trials when they hit. But I would suggest also there are two warnings that we need to take to heart in this text. The first is, the time to gain such wisdom is before trials hit. Proverbs 1 verses 20 through 33 tells us that if we neglect to get wisdom during calm times, we won't have it when calamity strikes. The second caution is that we must act on what we know or it won't do us any good. You know, Elisha warned the Israelite king of where the Arameans would attack. If the king had not followed up on that warning, it wouldn't have helped him. God's word warns us of where our enemy will strike. It warns us of the consequences of sin. But my friends, those warnings only profit us if we obey them. It's like the many warnings we hear about the dangers of smoking or, or eating uh, too many processed unhealthy sugary foods or of not buckling our seat belts. These warnings only help if we follow them. If we will learn the warnings of God's word and obey them, communing daily with him through prayer, then we will have his wisdom for dealing with trials. And our panic, well, our panic will be replaced with his peace. Well, the second thing we learn about prayer is that prayer opens our eyes to our spiritual reality. You know, it's probably fair to say most of us determine reality by our physical senses. If we can see, hear, feel, smell, taste it, it must be real. And I'm sure that for Elisha's servant, reality was thousands of soldiers mounted on powerful war horses who could wipe out the whole town of Dothan before nightfall. But for Elisha, that wasn't reality. For him, reality was the even greater and more powerful army of angels surrounding the city. These angels were there all along. The problem was Elisha's servant didn't have eyes to see them. But of course, his seeing not seeing them didn't make them unreal or non-existent. Elisha's prayer opened his eyes to see spiritual reality. And of course, spiritual reality is the ultimate reality, superseding the reality of what we perceive with our physical senses. You might remember the Apostle Paul. He knew how to see the unseen. He was suffering terrible persecution on behalf of the gospel, but he said that this momentary light affliction wasn't the real thing. The real thing was the eternal glory that awaited him in heaven. He also said that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Remember, when he wrote that, he was chained to a very real Roman guard as he wrote it. But he said that that isn't where our struggle takes place. Our real struggle is against these unseen forces of darkness in the heavenly places. And the way that we combat these forces is through prayer and the putting on of the armor of God. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 20. My friends, prayer opens up our eyes to spiritual reality and links us with God's winning majority. Remember years ago, the magazine Global Prayer Digest told about a medical missionary to Africa who was speaking at his home church here in Michigan. And he told about how he often had to travel by bicycle through the jungle to a city for supplies on his work and his mission. It was a two-day trip that required camping overnight at the halfway point. And when he got to the city, he would go to the bank, get money, and buy medicine and supplies to take back. On one of these trips, he saw two men fighting. One had been injured badly, so the missionary treated his wounds and witnessed to him about Jesus Christ. And then the missionary returned home without incident. On his next trip to town, the man, had that, the man that he had treated came up to him and said that he knew the missionary was carrying money and supplies. This man and some friends had followed him into the jungle, planning to kill him and to take his money and the medicines. But just as they were ready to move into his campsite, they saw that he was surrounded by 26 armed guards. Now, when the missionary heard this, he laughed and he said that he was all alone out of that jungle campsite. But the man really did insist. He said, no, not only I, but also my five friends. They saw and counted the 26 guards. And because of them, we were afraid and we left you alone. Well, at this point in the church in Michigan, where the missionary was telling the story, a man jumped to his feet and he asked the missionary, he said, can you tell me the exact day this took place? Well, the missionary thought for a moment and was able to give the exact date. The man in the church continued. He says, when it is night in Africa, I realize it's morning here. 
That morning, I was preparing to go play golf. As I was putting my golf bag in my car, I felt the Lord leading me to pray specifically for you. And this urging was so strong that I called the men in this church to meet here and pray for you. Would all of those men who met with me on that day please stand up? And they did so. All together, 26 men were standing. This brings me to a third realization about prayer. Prayer makes possible what is humanly impossible. You know, in our text, opening the servant's eyes to see the angels, closing and later reopening the soldier's eyes, these were humanly impossible feats. Elisha's prayer was not for his servant to do what he already could do or to use some ability he already possessed. His prayer was for God to do something humanly impossible to open his eyes, which saw the soldiers perfectly well so that he could see the angelic forces that protected him. My friends, so often when we pray, we forget that we are asking God to do the humanly impossible. When we pray for the salvation of another person, we are not asking God to help them out just a bit. We're asking God to do what is humanly impossible. Of course, every Every lost person in the world is spiritually blind. Only God can open blind eyes. We may realize this when the one we're praying for has big problems. We say, oh, he's an alcoholic. It would take a miracle to save him. But you know, not just the alcoholic, but every person. It also takes a miracle to save the good, moral person who goes to church every week. God must still open blind eyes to bring sinners to himself. You know, these Aramean soldiers had an easy job that they were confident they could do. Take a single unarmed man captive? No problem. We can do it. But you know, through Elisha's one-sentence prayer, these proud men were humbled into groping after the prophet, completely at his mercy. Then their eyes were opened in response to Elisha's next one-sentence prayer, and they realized that they were in big trouble. My friends, in the same way, God must humble the self-confident sinner so that he realizes he is spiritually impotent. Then God, well, God must open their eyes to see their desperate condition, that they are doomed unless God is gracious to them. Then God graciously sets before them the banquet table of the riches of Jesus Christ freely given. And though they had deserved his condemnation, he shows them his mercy. And so as we conclude this morning, let me tell you, in Christ, we have access to God as our all-sufficient treasure. If we will learn to know God as Elisha did and to pray as he prayed, we will not panic when trials hit. May God bless you as you pray this week.